Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for raising your health IQ with us coast to coast and around the world in more than 150 countries and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And the focus today is this. Milk, does it really do a body good? Well, it depends on who you ask. You know, whole milk in particular is loaded with in particular saturated fat but a new bill would put whole milk and all of that saturated fat right back in our schools at a time where childhood obesity is at an epidemic level. The rates just continue to go higher and higher. And we're going to be talking about what is known as the whole milk for healthy kids campaign with two guests today who are extraordinary experts on the topic. First, he is our director of government affairs at the physicians committee, Andrew Bonovi, and our good friend, a pediatrician who sees these health challenges facing children day after day after day in her practice. She is double board certified in both lifestyle medicine and pediatrics. Dr. Yami and her fancy frames are once again with us today. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I want to start with you here. Let's get the, kind of this wonky stuff out of the way first. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Whole milk has been out of schools since the Obama administration, right? What year was it originally taken out? Since 2012, a whole milk hasn't been on school lunch menus. And the reason it was taken out was because of concerns about saturated fat. Um, the dietary guidelines for Americans over and over recommend that saturated fat should be limited in everyone's diets, especially with kids. Uh, so that's why it was removed in 2012. And so the bill that we want to talk about today, the health so-called whole milk for healthy kids act would reverse this decision and compel schools to once again, offer full fat dairy milk. But what's probably more insidious about this besides uh, putting whole milk back into schools, is it would say, well, dairy milk is exempt from any school lunch requirements when it comes to saturated fat. So I think we're really doubling down on how bad saturated fat is in children's diets if we move forward with this bill. All right. All right. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The saturated fat in whole milk would be exempt from, you're saying, like the saturated fat limit that currently is established for meals in schools. Is that what you're saying, Andrew? Exactly right. So uh, for schools participating, participating in the National School Lunch Program, which is which is most most schools that are receiving funding from the federal government for their lunch programs, those meals need to adhere to certain nutrition standards. And those are based on the dietary guidelines. And we can talk more about improving the dietary guidelines, but that's that's not what this particular episode of the exam room is about. Um, but what the so-called, again, so-called whole milk for healthy kids act would do, would say, you know, we're just going to exempt dairy milk, all fluid milk from these requirements. And if you think about it, that's, that's a particularly problematic uh, thing for this bill to do. Not only would it, would it be saying saturated fat doesn't count when it comes to nutrition standards, but it'd be the first time that Congress is basically, you know, mandating itself around the science-based requirements of the dietary guidelines. And that is a real slippery slope. What's to stop Congress from saying, well, let's not count meat, let's not count beef or, you know, whatever it is towards these requirements. You know, the dietary guidelines say kids should get so much vitamin C in their diet. Well, let's just go do away with that as, um, because Congress you know, is, is pretty much saying it to uh, the scientists that come up with the dietary guidelines, we know better than you. And, and that's a, a particular uh, precedent that we don't want to set with this bill. Yeah, Dr. Yami, let's see if we can go inside the mind of these scientists. Is the saturated fat that is found in whole milk somehow magical? and just does not affect our body and our health in the same way that saturated fat from literally any other source would do? That's a confusing answer, but I will say this, in the standard American diet, saturated fat is coming from animal products, primarily dairy and meat. 
because that is what we're consuming the most of. So milk, cheese, meats, that's where saturated fat is coming from. And currently for children, the USA recommends that they have no more than 10% of their calories from saturated fat. So if a child is having a thousand calories, that would be 10 grams of saturated fat. Well, one cup of whole milk has five grams of saturated fat. And for children, the recommendation typically for dairy is two to three servings a day. So you're already going to be exceeding that. And we know that 67% of children are exceeding the requirements or the recommendations for saturated fat intake in our country. All right. Well, let's let's just talk in round numbers here. I don't know what the what the limits are currently for the school lunches, like how many grams of saturated fat are allowed or recommended even. Um, but let's just say that the number is 10. The five grams that come from the whole milk essentially would not count whatsoever toward that 10. And that leaves, you know, you can get it from the pizza and the French fries and whatever else is being served in the school lunch line that day. In addition to the five that are coming from that. So let's say that the total that they're consuming is 15 overall, but because the whole milk is exempt from the dietary guidelines, it essentially doesn't count. That's the loophole you're talking about. So it doesn't count on paper, but uh, when it comes to our health, Dr. Yami, I would uh, say that it accounts, you know, just as much as every other source of saturated fat, correct? Yes, I believe it does. The reason I said it's a confusing answer is because when we look at studies, we're looking at studies of people eating the standard American diet. So when you compare low fat skim milk versus whole milk and looking at the differences in diseases, sometimes it's hard to tease that apart because everybody's eating meat and eggs and all of that. So it's, it's hard to see the difference. So I think what's going on here is that they're using some of these studies to say, well, whole milk is better for our children because it may, some study may have shown that it actually decreases the risk of diabetes, et cetera. But I think that what's happening here is that they're using that as an excuse to get whole milk back in schools because it serves an interest. And so if the dairy industry can get whole milk back in schools, that allows them to be able to sell more milk, particularly whole milk, to a huge industry, which is our schools and our children. All right, Andrew, I, I want to talk to you about uh, industry influence in just a second. But really quickly, at the beginning of the show, Dr. Yami, I, I mentioned the childhood obesity trends. Can you talk to us as a pediatrician about what you are noticing and are, in fact, those trends continuing to climb up and up and up? We're seeing more and more children struggle with their weight at a young age. Yes, definitely. And it's because we just have an overconsumption of calories overall. We're just eating more calories than ever in the history of humanity. We have easy access to calories. Fast food is all around. Ultra processed foods are all around. And parents are confused. One third of parents think that the standard American diet is a healthy diet for their children. So we're just over consuming ultra processed calories and children are consuming 70% of their calories. They're deriving 70% of their calories from ultra processed foods. So yes, it's definitely a trend that's increasing. All pediatricians are seeing it. All physicians are seeing it. And I'm anticipating that it will continue to occur. All right, Andrew, you hinted at this just a moment ago, but let's talk about the industry influence here and, and get a little bit of a reminder of just how powerful uh, the dairy industry is up on Capitol Hill. Um, is this 100% driven by big dairy? So, and I, I usually try not to, I usually not try not to point fingers or point too many, too many uh, things at industry. But I think what was really compelling about this bill and really telling about this bill is when it was introduced, um, you know, it was introduced by uh, JT Thompson, uh, the House Agriculture Committee chair. And in the press release, you didn't hear from kids who were clamoring for more whole milk. You didn't hear from, you know, dietitians. You, what you heard from in that press release is the dairy industry. And, you know, Chairman Thompson is talking, talks about all this, um, we need to bring milk back into schools. It's been vilified um, and a real kind of like playing on the heartstrings of this, you know, typical um, what they think is a typical American dairy farmer. But 
make no mistake, dairy is a huge industry uh, and they have huge high powered uh, and high paying lobbyists uh, that are working on this bill in Capitol Hill. And this isn't just, you know, one one industry we're talking about. We're talking about dairy producers. We're talking about the, you know, the, the folks that are, are pasteurizing the milk. We're talking about all parts of this uh, industry that are trying to make sure that Congress is putting milk on every every school lunch tray. And one of the things that we mentioned earlier is about how, you know, when it comes to school school meals, this is a big market. Uh, the National School Lunch Program serves something like 30 million students each school year. Uh, so that is 30 million opportunities for the dairy industry to make a sale. Um, they have the right to market their products. That's something that they can do. But when they're going to Capitol Hill and trying to get loopholes in school nutrition standards so they can make those sales, well, that's that's something that really, really shouldn't uh, shouldn't be moving forward. And does this bill have bipartisan support right now? Does that appear? It does have bipartisan support, right? You know, the dairy industry is not a Republican or a Democrat kind of thing. It is, you know, something that is is again has has a sway uh, in a lot of different offices and from East Coast to West Coast. Uh, so it's something that it's really important to have honest brokers when we're talking about nutrition policy, when we're talking about food policy, whether that's in Capitol Hill or to USDA or to industries or, or, or whoever we're talking to. And I think that's one of the things that the physician committee does really well is we come in and we present the science, we come in and show what people should be eating and what they shouldn't be eating and why, and really polish, policy should be following that. It should be following science. It should be following physicians and dietitians and, and everyone. Um, that knows what what really we should be eating instead. Um, but unfortunately, too much of food policy, too much of school meal policy and all of that um, industry has a sway in as well. Uh, so that's what we were constantly fighting here when we're working on policy at the Physicians Committee is this, this battle between science on one hand and industry and, and commerce on the other. All right. Uh, Dr. Yami, let me jump back to you here. Um, the science that you have seen has clearly led you to state that, you know, milk should not be part of or dairy milk should not be part of the diet. Um, I, I am curious, beyond the obesity trends, which we've started at, what other studies have you seen that have really kind of popped up on your radar saying, yeah, this is really not something that I should be giving to my child because it's not just being overweight that's the risk here. It's all of these other conditions as well. What are some of those conditions? Okay. Well, I'm just going to say to start off, one of the reasons that milk remains part of the conversation as such an important thing is because we've associated milk with calcium intake. And so the justification has been, we need to drink milk, we need to have dairy to get enough calcium to have strong bones. Well, there was a review study that was released in 2020, the New England Journal of Medicine, Walter Willa et al. And it found that really, if you look at all these studies over time, Milk is not protecting our bones. In fact, the places that have higher milk intake have higher risk of hip fracture. So as a physician, as a pediatrician who sees all these adverse effects of milk, which I'll just start with lactose intolerance, 70% of the world has lactose intolerance, which leads to abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, flatulence, bloating, makes kids uncomfortable, gives them abdominal pain, gives them chronic constipation, associated with acne, associated with eczema. There's a lot of detriments to milk, but we have spent so many years justifying its consumption because our bones, because our bones need it, because it has calcium. Well, if we have this review study showing, actually not only is it not protecting our bones, it's increasing our risk of hip fractures, then why is it even part of the conversation at all? I would advocate that we don't need milk. And in fact, milk is causing more harm than benefit. So what are some healthier sources of calcium, you might say, that you could even say are on a one-to-one -one level uh, with the amount that you'd be getting in milk? Well, if you want to just 
compare one to one and parents are uncomfortable and they want to just substitute it with something, then go with a calcium fortified plant-based milk, such as an unsweetened soy milk or an unsweetened pea protein milk. And then you can just substitute one for one and you'll be fine. But there's lots of plant-based sources of calcium. We have our beans, we have our greens. We also have other fortified products like fortified orange juice, calcium set tofu. There are plenty of sources of calcium in a plant-based diet. So if you're eating a diverse range of foods, of whole plant foods and fortified plant foods in adequate calorie amounts, then you'll have enough calcium intake, especially for children. True or false? This is always one of my fun facts. Uh, broccoli has calcium in it, correct? Yes. Yeah. So who would have thought? <laughs> I never would have thought that in a million years growing up, you know? And broccoli <laughs> was served in school lunches. I mean, Andrew, I don't know if it was in your school lunch growing up, but that was like one of the vegetables. It was cooked to death in my school. I mean, like this was broccoli that had been on the lunch line all week, you know? So by the time Friday rolled around, you didn't even like, hardly recognize it. But I, I don't know. Andrew, was it in your schools? Yeah, we, we had a we had broccoli, a lot of corn. I remember eating a lot of corn, mixed vegetables, things like that. But you know, I'm not I'm not the I'm not the dietitian here or the physician here, but one thing I'm always I'm always reminded of is that, you know, cows aren't making calcium themselves. They're getting it from their diet and they're eating green leafy vegetables. So I always kind of put that in the back of my mind as well, is that uh, you know, the spinach and the kale, et cetera, is is also just like a cow, that's where they get their calcium from. Absolutely, my man. It always it, it helps to get the non doctor, non nutritionist perspective from time to time. The lay person, I always feel like that's my role. So if you if you ever have something that you've absorbed from our experts, feel free to echo it out there. Feel free to mm -hmm. echo it out there. Don't be ashamed, Andrew. Um, Dr. Yami, another thing that I want to bring up here that I know that is really paramount and when we talk about this bill and the importance of making sure that it does not pass uh, is the rising rates of uh, type 2 diabetes among children. And I remember growing up, type 2 diabetes wasn't even called type 2 diabetes. It was adult onset diabetes. But now we're seeing more and more children develop type 2 diabetes. How concerning is that to you? It's very concerning because it's a sign that we're having metabolic dysfunction from an early age. And if it's starting in childhood, adolescence, it's only going to get worse because most of the time we aren't taking measures to potentially halt it or reverse it. We're just doing, you know, little measures here and there that aren't really going to make a big difference. So it is going to have a huge impact on our medical system, on our society. And, you know, just think of all these children they're starting with chronic illness from their teen years. It, it's not a happy life. It, they don't feel good and their productivity is going to be lower, their you know, ability to just enjoy life. And as a pediatrician, one of my goals is to help support well-being and longevity in my patients. I want them to live long, healthy lives and feel good while they're doing it. Yeah, that seems to be the goal. And another study, you know, you talk about feeling good, not just physically, but mentally as well. Study just published in JAMA recently talked about the increased uh, amount of depressive symptoms that are associated with children who are eating uh, an excessive amount of, uh, you know, fat and in turn are struggling with their weight. So you, on one hand, I mean, I can talk to this from experience, being overweight and being put on antidepressants in the sixth grade. I had no idea at the time that that was tied to my diet, but looking back, it seems to make all the sense in the world, Dr. Yami. Yeah, absolutely. It's multifactorial. So if you can imagine being a child, you're eating all these ultra processed foods, you don't feel good inside. It affects our brain chemistry. So we know that people that have depression, anxiety, if they start eating more green leafy vegetables, berries, more whole plant foods, they start to feel better just from the diet change. But this is not what children are eating. 70% of their calories are coming from ultra processed foods. So these are foods that must be made in a factory. That's what an ultra processed food is. You cannot make it at home. High in fat, high in sugar, high in salt, additives, artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, all of these things, it's affecting their brains. Um, but you know, also a child that is over consuming calories, they may have a larger body size, they may not be able to function in the world the way that they'd like to go out and play, participate in sports, you know, all of those things. So it is multifactorial. And it's something that we need to realize is affecting our children, and it's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. 
All right, stand by, Andrew. I'm going to come back to you in just two shakes. But uh, Dr. Yami, be beyond childhood, um, what do we know in terms of just even for adult health here? Because I kind of want to plant the seed for where I'm going to go with you, Andrew, in just a second. Uh, in terms of consumption of dairy and that saturated fat, uh, in terms of heart health, maybe even cancer risk, what do we know about that association? It, it, it can be confusing to look at the science, but if you look at the Milk and Health Review from 2020, when they really separate everything out, dairy is not helping us. It is one of our biggest sources, in fact, probably the biggest source of saturated fat in our diet. And that saturated fat is associated with metabolic disease. And our number one killer, just to remind everybody, so this is what's going to kill our children as well when they grow up, is heart disease. So we really should be focused on what can we do to decrease our risk of heart disease. And that's going to be eating more whole plant foods, keeping a low fat diet, and avoiding ultra processed foods and foods that are high in saturated fat, which one of our number one sources is dairy. All right, and Andrew, this is kind of with, with that setting the table, this is kind of what shocked me is that uh, you tipped me off to the fact that one of the sponsors of this bill is themselves a physician, is that correct? <laughs> Correct. The Senate sponsor of this bill is Dr. Roger Marshall from uh, Kansas. He's he is a senator, uh, and you know he is all pushing pushing for dairy all the time. It seems in in Congress. So I think you know like like I mentioned before, the the need for you know honest brokers in policy discussions around food. Um, we need to bring that science. We don't just need to bring you know what's best for Kansas and the Kansas dairy farmer. And that's you know may be a, a very valid thing for him to represent. But if we're talking about food and if we're talking about nutrition and what's best for, for kids and, and what's best for a school meal, we need to make sure that we're focusing on the science and not, and not on other interests. That, that just, you know, when you even conflicting science where it seems like maybe at the very least you could say the jury's still out. I'm not sure that it's ethical, and this is just my opinion, I cannot speak on behalf of the organization, I'm just not sure that it's ethical then to back something where the science is murky at the very least, which could in turn be detrimental to your constituents. Obviously, it's going to positively influence the bottom line for a number of them, but in terms of the health for all of them, if the science is murky consciously, I'm not sure that that's anything that anybody should be supporting, Andrew. Right. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not an ethics expert, <laughs> but I do know that in this case, we, you know, it's really important that, you know, Congress is hearing from all, all people. It's hearing from citizens that are saying, you know, it's not just, it's not just dairy farms in Kansas. It's also people like me, people like me that have kids in schools in Kansas. And when my kid goes to the lunch, lunch room, they aren't even able to get easily a non-dairy option. And that's something that that Congress needs to be hearing about. So whatever it is, all, all across your political spectrums, I think it's really important to make sure that we're focusing on, on this, this science. And science tells us again and again um, that saturated fat is leads to health risk and saturated fat should be limited in your diet. And saturated fat is in dairy. It is the, uh, you know, one of the leading sources of, of saturated fat in American's diets, as Dr. Yami mentioned. So all of this comes together and you're saying, why is Congress move forward, moving forward with this bill and, and other things to really push, push dairy? Um, and it's just really important that everyone is at the table when, when Congress is talking about, about food and policy issues, uh, because we really need to make sure everyone is part of this conversation. Again, which makes the the loophole aspect of this bill even more baffling. You know, why would the saturated fat from this whole milk? And, and, and just to be clear, we're talking about fluid milk, the cartons of milk that are served. We're not talking about the cheese that's on the pizza or on the cheeseburger. It's simply the fluid milk, correct? Correct. Correct. Mind-numbing that such a thing would exist in this bill and why that wouldn't count. I, I It just... I don't know. So if somebody's listening to this or watching us on YouTube or Facebook, Andrew, uh, and they want to make their voice heard, this is, uh, you know, you mentioned Kansas a number of times, but this is obviously a national bill. So how can they make their voices heard? What would you recommend? Sure. Well, let me just mention kind of like where we are in this process and how, and then I can mention how folks can get involved. So 
we're we're we need to make sure people are speaking up because this bill has already passed the house uh it still needs to pass the senate and but we are we are making a push towards uh, the senate to ensure that doesn't happen what you can do if you're listening to this or maybe watching this at home is you can go to pcrm.org slash healthy students and there you'll find an a little bit more information about this bill and you'll find a form that you can fill out where you can contact your senator and tell them this isn't something that we should be we should be passing. Uh, we need to oppose this bill to make sure that science is leading when it comes to um, to food policy. And we need to make sure that we're not just doing what the dairy industry wants by carving out loopholes in school nutrition standards. There it is. You see it on your screen right now, pcrm.org slash healthy students. So important. And we'll also put a link to that in the show description and in the episode notes. Um, that loophole thing, Dr. Yami, it, it just, it irks me. So Andrew, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, elaborate on that and, and letting us know how we can get involved and make our voices heard. Um, final question goes to you, Dr. Yami. If this were to pass, how much of a setback do you think this would be in terms of our health? How much do you think it would accelerate the rising rates of obesity and all of the issues that come with that? It's hard to say. I think we do have some good news is that I feel like children are drinking less milk overall and families are starting to purchase more plant-based milks. So I think that that's a big change that parents are waking up to, hey, maybe dairy is not the best thing for us. Maybe I've also seen some detriments to my health from consuming dairy. But I guess the last thing I'd like to say, Chuck, if it's okay, is that we need to have some healthy skepticism when it comes to this bill, because we get very emotional about children. We want to protect children, children, everybody loves their kids. We would do anything for our kids. So whenever we make a bill that's, quote, for the health of children, people start to listen, but it's just a cover up for what I think is just something to benefit the dairy industry. If we really cared about children's health, why isn't there a bill out there that eliminates, makes it illegal for schools to have processed meat on the menu. We know that that's a class one carcinogen. We don't have that bill. So basically what we're using is this as an excuse for children's health or whatever to get more milk into schools, which is going to benefit the dairy industry. So I want people to have a healthy skepticism and to realize that this is not good for our children. This is just a way to use a loophole that could even make things worse for us in the future. You know what I like about you is that you practice what you preach and you you walk the talk and you walk it really well. And you don't just walk the talk. You run it, you swim it, you bike it. And you are 100% plant-based and uh, the proof is in the pudding, my friend. So let me show you something. Dr. Yami recently completed uh, an Ironman and this is her at the finish line. I believe you did quite well uh, on the bike and on foot setting personal records. Is that right, Dr. Yami? Yeah, so the picture you have there is my first one, which was a month ago. And a couple of days ago, I just did my second one, 70.3. And I did set PRs on my second one. So I'm very, very pleased about that. And yeah, it's been an incredible journey. And I feel really proud being able to say that I am 100% plant-based vegan athlete. I'm thriving. I feel great. The second time I recovered so quick that the next morning I went out for another bike ride. So yeah, it's a testament to this way of eating. It works. A Andrew, let's back that up and just kind of rehash what it is you just said. Oh, I did my first little less than a month ago and then at the up net just did my second two. That's two Ironmans in a month, Andrew. What are you and I doing, buddy? Uh, I've listened to the song Iron Man at least twice. And then, <laughs> but that's, that's about it. So that's amazing oh that's man amazing. you guys uh, are amazing thank you so very much for your time today talking about this really important topic uh the loophole again is just absolutely mind-blowing murky science we got to make our voices heard and uh, continue to raise our health iqs that's what the show is all about dr yami thank you so very much for your time be sure to give her a follow at the dr yami on instagram and check out uh, her podcast i am human fantastic listen as well subscribe wherever it is that you get your shows andrew does not have a podcast but sir you are welcome here anytime 
<laughs> thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. All right. Andrew Bonovi, Dr. Yami, thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.